Dragon Quest XI, Echoes of an Elusive Age, sets a new standard for production values in JRPGs, but does its beauty wholly reflect the quality of this massive adventure? Dragon Quest XI's central story revolves around you, the Chosen One, setting out to save the world and fulfill your prophecy by collecting elemental orbs scattered all throughout the land. No, not an entirely unique premise, but the overall cast of characters you meet along the way, along with its overall jolly tone, make this classic style of storytelling remind you of simpler times from this genre. The world structure takes a slightly more hands-off approach compared to previous entries by allowing you to jump around and explore environments in entirely new ways. This is also expanded upon by using certain monsters as mounts after you defeat them in battle, allowing you to access previously inaccessible areas. These cannot be used all over the game world, however, and are only really useful for the small sections where the game requires them. These mounts do help with changing up the formula from time to time by adding this mechanic straight from its sister series, Dragon Quest Monsters. However, the moment-to-moment -moment exploration of the world does not feature many puzzles or nuanced mechanics outside of the system. The battle system here is of your traditional turn-based variety, but offers two distinct styles for you to choose. While technically both functioning entirely the same, they do allow you to experience fights slightly differently. The first allows you to freely move and look around during battles, giving you somewhat of a sense of real-time combat, but it's purely only visual and none of your movements affect attacks or turn order. I opted for the second style, called Classic, and it functions like the Dragon Quest games of the past. I greatly endorse picking this option, unless you prefer the semi-real-time, semi-turn-based battle systems like Final Fantasy XI or the Xenoblade series. Each one of your characters will enter into these battles with an assortment of abilities and spells along with the traditional attacking and defending. Your partners will act entirely on their own unless you adjust their tactics to follow your own commands for people who prefer greater influence over fights. The battle system itself will be very familiar to anyone who has played nearly any other turn-based RPG before, and only really changes up what you come to expect of the genre with its inclusion of the pep system. During battles, your heroes will occasionally be granted a blue aura that increases all their stats for a time. This aura is useful in itself, but the real fun begins with multiple characters being pepped up. This allows for huge hitting elaborate attacks or buffs that require multiple heroes to perform. These special team combos will end their pepped up state, but the usefulness of these powerful abilities will often make it well worth the trade-off. The team management here consists of the standard equipment slots for standard weapons, shields, helmets, armor, and accessory slots. Party members can be geared up in towns, or by use of your personal forge where you can create entirely new gear, or power up others you've already purchased or found. This crafting system could have been easily convoluted, but it keeps it simple and enjoyable by having you manage the heat levels of your forge, all while planning your blacksmithing strikes accordingly, in order to make higher quality items. Every character also has a fairly straightforward skill tree that doesn't offer much flexibility overall. The most important choice you'll ever make with it for each character will be the very first upgrade you choose as this will dictate which weapon they will specialize in. The skill tree offers some means to tinker with the synergies of your team, but the slow pace in which these skill points are dulled out will have you often make more use of the spells learned naturally through leveling up, rather than the ones that you pick on this skill tree. It attacked one of our men while we were out on patrol. The Slayer of the Sands is back? Why must the accursed creature always appear on this, the happiest day of the year? The only real issue I had with Dragon Quest XI came down to the overall ease of the adventure that never required me to min-max or fully utilize many of the features I previously mentioned. I found the almost entirely avoidable enemies to be far too forgiving to ever pose any real threat not only at the start of the game, but all the way through to the later areas. I actually stopped and went back to the main menu at one point to see if I accidentally enabled some kind of easy mode because of how off the enemy aggression felt in almost every situation. I would greatly go back to the old school style of random encounters as opposed to this new nearly passive system that felt more like you're going through the starting zone of an MMO for upward of 60 hours to where battles only really take place when you choose to engage. I never felt like I was surviving through new regions or dungeons, which is usually the most memorable aspect of this genre for me. The only time the game really pushes back is in its well-designed boss encounters. These fights would make me use my team's full toolset that was never really required for the standard enemies. 
These boss encounters gave me a glimpse of what could have been, and throughout my journey I regularly wished they threw more resistance at me more often, so that I would better appreciate every level up, equipment upgrade, and newfound ability. Dragon Quest XI nearly achieves one of the greatest JRPG adventures of this generation, but instead provides a lengthy, albeit light overall experience. Its nearly passive nature might make it forgettable for some, but if you're looking to ease yourself into a grand JRPG epic, you can't go wrong with this as your starting point. This has been Deadite from Boomstick Gaming. If you enjoy this style of content, consider checking out my Patreon that helps fund this channel, or subscribe if you prefer a focus on game mechanics and systems, because that's what makes anything from 8-bit to 8K equally enjoyable. Thanks for watching.